Hello, everyone. Yeah. I'm Shane McElroy, and welcome to all of you joining us for our first in the series of three Momentum from Milk live webinars happening this week in advance of the new milking season. Our topic today is getting to grips with grass, where members of our on farm team will bring us through some of the key pointers towards managing grass and nutrient applications over the coming weeks to get herd nutrition off to the best start. To cover the topic, we're grateful to have two speakers on our webinar today. We have Elaine Brady, who's our ruminant nutritionist, and Michael Ryan, our senior business manager from the Tierland Farm team. For today's interactive session, you'll also have an opportunity to ask questions from the technical experts on how to manage grass, nutrients, and early season cow nutrition. The format of the webinar today is to have a number of slides uh, from Elaine uh, and Michael, and this will be followed by a question and answer session, and we'd encourage everyone to submit your questions uh, for the Q&A session, and you can do that from, from now. Uh, we'll have the webinar recorded and it'll be available afterwards on Tierland Farm Life and on our YouTube channel, and we'll run until about a quarter to two today, for about 45 minutes with the first half as, as presentations and the second half as Q&A. So if you can uh, email your questions to questions at tierlandfarmlife.com or text message to 086 180 3947 and those numbers will be up on the screen. So just to cover off the overview of, of the presentations today, uh, Michael Ryan is going to go through the Gain Momentum program, just a quick overview on that. And then Elaine will take us through Great Grass program and planning the first rotation of grazing. And then uh, Mick will take us through the early spring nutrient application of either slurry or, or fertilizers. And then we come back to maximizing milk solids with early lactation feeding. And as I say, the, um, the, the questions that you'd like to ask, please text those in to 086 So I'll hand over to Michael to kick it off. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shane. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Ryan. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief outlay of the four different parts of the Gain Momentum program. So first up, and which I'll discuss later on, is a great grass piece. So within great grass, we will be covering soil nutrition uh, and grassland yields. Uh, in terms of soil nutrition, we have a suite of offerings uh, in terms of soil sampling for our customers. So, you know, we a DIY service. We have a, a, a service where farmers can effectively avail of someone going out to do the sampling for them. We get a mapping done of all the, of all the indexes on the farm. And also for those who don't have an NMP, we can uh, get a soil nutrient program uh, drawn up for those who don't have it. In terms of grassland yields, uh, you know, we have come up with a template there that will show basically you know, how to achieve 13 tons of dry matter over the course of the 12 months. Within that, you know, within the template, it shows roughly where, you know, each month, what your total cumulative yield should be and what you should be growing each month so that you can track yourself in relation to the amount of grass that, that you can grow. Second part of the Gain Momentum program is a herd nutrition piece. Within the herd nutrition piece, we have, you know, our business managers who are on the road who essentially be going on farm who can basically look at the farm and see what's needed from you know uh, a nutritional point of view we have pro programs such as ruminate etc where the farmer can actually or the business manager can sit down with the farmer and then drop a diet and just drop a balanced diet so we, we offer that uh, on, on on farm piece another part of the gain momentum programs herd health within herd health and probably one of the most important aspects of herd health is our in-house uh, health degrees screening. You know, that's, it's a fierce important tool in order to give the proper advice and few as the farmer to see, you know, do you need, you know, what kind of a dosing program you actually need based on, on, on results and what kind of a vaccination program that, you, that you'd have. So that's one of our key pieces in, in, our, in our herd health section. And finally, the fourth part of our Gain Momentum program is our mixed solids piece. Elaine will be dealing with that there shortly. But within the, 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 the Gain Mixed Solids piece, within our Gain Momentum program, what we've decided to do is basically we have three different trackers for farmers to basically track themselves in terms of solids, um, you know, produced within the year. So as an example, we have a 450 kilo uh, mix solid program. We have a 500 kilo mix solid program and we have a 550 kilo mix solid program. So what that shows is basically it's a tracker again, January, February, March onwards, what the total amount of solids can be produced per cow, where you should be tracking. So if you're tracking yourself, say for 500 kilos of milk solids in the month of March, what should, be, should you be producing? Should be producing in around 1.8 kilos of milk solids on average for the month of March. So if effectively folks, there's our, our full suite of offerings in our Gain Momentum program. And uh, 
Elaine, I'll hand it over to you next. Thanks, Michael. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be focusing on um, the, the planning for the first rotation and early grazing management. So um, it's important that uh, you set up your grazing platform for the grazing season and your first rotation is part of that. So ensuring there'll be enough uh, grass in the diet then comes second rotation and into the breeding season and making sure cows um, get the nutrition that they need. So a spring rotation planner is a great tool to manage your spring grazing. Um, so it ensures that you have sufficient grass until the end of your first rotation. So hitting that um, magic day. So when grass uh, supply uh, meets your herd demand. So it allows you to divide up uh, the grazing platform. So allocating grass each day um, and each week. So here you can see there's a table um, that sets out your, your target turnout dates and how much to graze um, um, on a percentage basis. So the, the target for a dry farm is to have 30% grazed within the first week of March and then have 60% uh, grazed then around Paddy's Day and then 100% grazed um, in, within the first week of April. Now, when it comes to a wet farm, this will depend um, on your your weather conditions uh, and soil type uh, when you get out uh, first, but usually um, two weeks after your dry farms is the, is the target. Um, so what do you need to plan your spring rotation planner is your open average farm cover. So ideally, um, if you haven't done so already to do that now, um, to know your average open farm cover, how much grass is on the farm, and then look back to your previous year to see when your when was your magic day and plan around that. So usually the first rotation is around 100 days uh, in length. And then your second rotation will be then a lot shorter. And one thing that the spring rotation planner doesn't take into account is uh, the impact of stocking rates. So how many cows are grazing? So this will have to change as more cows um, uh, go out to grass um, as the calving season um, goes on. Also, it doesn't take into consideration the weather conditions or growth rates. So it's important to keep measuring um, your grass uh, through your first rotation to be able to make uh, timely adjust adjustments to your uh, spring rotation planner. So whether you use pasture base or just uh, a paper exercise, uh, it's uh, important to keep on track on that particularly since early spring grass is worth around four euro per cow per day on farms, according to Chagas. And this is due to the high input costs at present. Next slide, Jane. Thank you. Um, so what are the benefits to the spring rotation planner? So it stimulates growth. So as you gra graze off the first few paddocks, uh, these will uh, allow time for these paddocks to grow back high quality grass um, for the second rotation. Um, it also reconditions your swords for the year, so removes any dead material that has accumulated over, over the winter period. Um, it also reduces your feed cost, so the grass is your cheapest um, feed source and which is of very high quality, so pr provides that energy and uh, protein. And also, um, increases then your, your milk out, um, particularly in terms of protein percentage. So many of you, you uh, might notice that once cows go out to grass, your, your protein percentage will rise. And this is because grass is uh, a high, uh, feed, of high feed value. It can also reduce your workload. So um, letting cows out to grass early can reduce that workload in the shed. So you don't have to be um, uh, lime your kugels, scraping cubicles, and allows you to focus on those uh, uh, cows that are calving as well. Um, so I now uh, hand it back over to Michael, and he'll talk about how to manage your uh, nutrient application for your your grazing. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so, folks, uh, Elaine has basically discussed, you know, the reasons why you want spring grass. I'm going to do my best to try and uh, discuss, you know, how to, how to grow it and how to, uh, to, to supply it in terms of nutrients. 
first piece I want to talk about in relation to this is kind of cattle slurry. And if you look at the value of fertilizer at the moment, Chagas have a figure coming out there of, you know, for every 2,000 gallons of slurry, you know, it's a, an economic value is 100, euro, 100 euros. So if you look at putting slurry on, 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 onto your, your farm, and we just say as an example, if you go 100 acre farm, Chagas recommend that you put, you cover 40% of your farm, you know, in the January, February period with, with 2,000 gallons per acre slurry. If you look at that as a value, you know, and sorry, uh, that's at under covers of a thousand euros or thousand uh, kgs of dry matter per hectare. But if you look at that 40 acres that you'll cover first, that's about 4,000 euros uh, worth of fertilizer that you will effectively, be, you know, putting out through, through slurry. So it's a very, very valuable, um, very valuable co commodity. So that's your January, February piece. You'd be looking at, you say, your lowest covers, which would be about 40% of your farm, you cover with slurry. The next time then that we'd be looking at slurry, you know, will be around mid-February onwards. And if you look at, we'll say, the next part of the farm that you should be covering for slurry is the first 30% of the farm that you would have grazed. So Chag's advised there that you go over 2,500 gallons to the acre, which would, you know, bring roughly speaking around 16 or 20 units of nitrogen uh, per, per acre. And that should, that, that should suffice in terms of P's and K's, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 for the spring. So if you look at, we'll say, the 40% of the ground that you cover, that you covered first, then the next 30% of, of ground that you effectively cover because it's grazed, you'll have, you know, by the, say, the end of February, you'll have in the region of 70% of your farm covered with slurry. The next piece we're going to discuss is in relation to artificial fertilizer and what kind of artificial fertilizer and when you should apply. You know, protected urea, you know, is the product of choice for all the reasons from an environmental point of view. You know, and we want to try and promote that as much as possible, uh, or, you know, in, in 2023. So Chag's advice, you know, on the first bit of ground that you would have covered with slurry, around 20 units per ni of nitrogen per acre in around early February. Again, now we're talking about dry farms here, folks, and it's going to be later for, 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 uh, for the wetter farms. Then on the 30%, the 215% uh, that you would have grazed um, air air first, Chagas also recommend that you go with 20 to 23 units per acre, respectively, in mid-February. Okay, again, in protected urea farm. And then on the final 30%, which would be the ground that should be grazing up to probably um, Paddy's Day, that you should go out uh, with 23 units of N, of, N, of N per acre. Okay, so that's the first round uh, of, uh, of N uh, uh, application. Next time then that you go and, and you'd, you'd be spreading N is around March onwards. Okay, so just to start off again with, you know, with the ground that you first cover with slurry, you know, that would be shortly grazed. Uh, they, be, they advise 20 units of, of N per acre. The first 30% uh, that was grazed, uh, you know, you need to come out with 20 to 23 units. And then, you know, the, the, the last, or the 30% the that you would have grazed, or this, you know, the last 30% you have grazed before Paddy's Day, you come out with 40 units of N. So in total, you know, you'd have in the region of 56 to about 66 units of N uh, per acre applied by the 1st of April. OK, now I think we just need to be a little bit cautious in relation to what we're talking, you know, generic. We need to talk generic here. A lot of this depends on, you know, how dry your farm it is, etc. But there is a large variation, OK, in the amount uh, in the response to N in the springtime because, you know, of weather conditions and soil conditions. And Chagas have come out there that the variation can be between five to 18 kilos of dry matter, uh, you know, of N applied. So it can be a big, big variation. They do recommend, though, that once it passes 11 to 12 kilos of dry matter per hectare in terms of growth, you know, that is the most economical time to start spreading. So just bear that in mind. So Shane, you go on to the next slide, please. So basically, consider, considerations before spreading, okay? What do you need to do? What do you need to be aware of? Is it, check the forecast is the first thing. So. Again, it's recommended that you don't spread either fertilizer, artificial fertilizer, or, or slurry 48 hours before rain or 48 hours after rain. Uh, soil temperature is greater, it must be greater than six degrees in rising. I think that's a fierce, important piece, okay? So to get a maximum utilization out of the nutrients, be it slurry or be it um, uh, artificial fertilizer, you know, you need to have six degrees and rising, okay? So in other words, the plant needs to be actively growing in order to uptake the nutrients, the biggest benefit of that is that you know the nutrients are being uptaken by by the grass, you know, and also that you're you know there's less leaching going into the likes of uh, water courses, etc. Soil traffic ability, kind of an obvious one, you know, if it's 
if it's too wet to travel, it's too wet to get out. Even if you have an umbilical, just be very, very careful that you don't overdo it. Be very mindful uh, 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 of leaching. And the final piece, and the one we always get, we get asked uh, very, very often is, where to apply slurry? I think the central piece on that is your nutrient put into the top drawer of your file cabinet or on your desk. They're never really looked at. We really need to do is pull them out and have a look and see where your lower index is. So prioritize those lower index to try and get the slurry out, to try and get your P's and K's um, up as quickly as possible for the, for the, for the main growing season, growing season to make sure that they're there uh, ready and available to the plant for, for, for peak growth. But your NMP plan is vital to, uh, to put the slurry where, where, it's, where it's needed or your nutrients where it's needed. So Shane, back over to Elaine, who's going to talk about um, milk solids. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about how to uh, optimize performance um, in terms of milk production and fertility. So as you can see, this graph um, kind of il illustrates that uh, a cow goes through a challenging period after calving. So this is commonly known as the transition period. Um, and this, this challenged um, period can last up to uh, 100 days. So the, the cow um, has to contend with a lot. Um, so the main factor that's causing this energy shortage um, is because she's um, her dry matter intake um, lags behind her milk production. So her milk production is um, increasing significantly um, each week, peaking at around six to eight weeks, and her dry matter is not peaking until between nine or twelve weeks um, after that. Um, after calving, so even uh, with, um, within that, she's also trying to maintain her bond distance score. She's trying to recover after calving, so involution, uh, resume the cyclicity, and also uh, try and reach peak milk all within that 100 days. Um, so it's important to um, uh, have proper good uh, nutritional management to avoid any excess negative energy uh, balance that might occur in early lactation. Now, negative energy balance can't be avoided, but avoiding excessive and um, making sure it doesn't la last for a long period of time. So ensuring a one way, one of the main ways to um, uh, manage that is making sure cows don't lose more than half a bond addition score um, from calving until breeding. Uh, next slide, please, Shane. So a way of trying to reduce negative energy is making um, sure that the cow's room requirements are met. So the most important um, uh, demand is meeting that energy demand in terms of uh, feed um, to match her, her performance or uh, production potential. So firstly, knowing the quality of your forest that you have on farm. So knowing your, your quality of your silage. So ideally you want cows to have high quality silage, so between 72 and 75 DMD, ideally. However, if there's a lower quality silage on farm, let's say, for example, 68 DMD, this will result, um, this is more less, less digestible. So this means that it'll be a slower passage rate through the cow, um, result in lower intake, and therefore lower energy intake. So. Um, trying to maximize the amount of energy per kg of dry matter intake is the focus in early lactation. And this is what concentrates do or, or supplementation is try to get as much um, energy into that cow. So the, the lower quality your silage is, the greater amount of concentrates you will have to feed. So when it comes to uh, grazing then, um, it's knowing how much you're actually allocating the cow and how much the cows are actually eating in terms of grass. Grass is of high quality, but it can vary, uh, vary in terms of dry matter intake. So for example, um, on a wet day, their dry matter intake can uh, reduce significantly, uh, particularly in early lactation when their, their intake is, is low initially anyways. So this will have to be um, their, their intake gap or the energy gap has to be 
has to be um, supplemented in terms of concentrates. Um, so for example, a cow producing 28 litres, uh, that might have an intake, dry matter intake of grass of 12 kgs, we need 7 kgs of concentrates. However, a cow with intake of 14 kgs of dry matter um, will only need 5 kgs of concentrates to um, meet her requirement. So it's important knowing the production potential of your cows. Um, so the, the size of your cow and how many litres she's producing to match that requirement in terms of feed. Um, so it's also important to have enough um, high quality forage available coming to the second rotation. So this is where your, your spring rotation planner comes um, into effect or is important uh, to manage that. So you don't want to be dropping below uh, 600 kgs of dry matter of grass per hectare of an average farm cover um, come uh, towards the end of March to ensure that there is sufficient grass coming into uh, April and the breeding season. And if there is a period of time where grass growth might uh, be poor or there's poor grazing conditions, always make sure that there's uh, you have a backup of a high quality forage, forage available, um, whether that's high quality grass silage or maize, whatever is is available, because you you will always need to have a certain percentage of forage in the diet. Um, to be able to feed concentrates. So the minimum you want is 60% uh, of forage in the diet to maintain that uh, room and environment. And next slide, please. Um, so as Michael uh, mentioned earlier, this is the milk sol solids tracker. So this allows you to track um, your milk solids, whether you're aiming to have a 450 kgs per cow, 500 or 550 kgs uh, per cow. So this is where you can see where your nutrition, nutritional management can um, have an effect on your, your milk solids. So look, for example, if we take a 500 kgs uh, per cow in March, the aim is to produce 1.8 kgs of milk solids per day. Um, and it also allows you uh, to track then where you might fall down throughout the year, maybe in April or May, June, where you might indicate uh, there's not enough uh, energy in the diet, there's not enough grass in the diet, or grass quality is poor. So it allows you to identify maybe uh, where you might be able to improve um, in terms of nutritional management, but it also takes into account and not to forget your heart health, um, having a good vaccination program, um, good heifer rearing program when they do come into the um, milking herd and good grass management. So all these uh, uh, come together to, to maximize your, your milk performance and milk solids production. Um, that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Elaine, and to Michael as well. Um, excellent, excellent slides and, and information there. Um, look, we've um, we have a, a Q and A session now. We have a good number of questions in, and thanks to everyone who sent in their uh, their questions for our speakers. Um, we have some people giving their names and some people not giving their names. But if you want to put your name and your county on it, that would be great. And uh, so text in your questions to 086 180 three nine four seven or you can email them as well to questions at tierlandfarmlife.com um first question coming in elaine is for yourself it's from joe hasn't said his county um what dry matter would you use for opening farm grass cover and how many days after calving should they be allowed out, out to grass so how soon do we get them out and what's the dry matter um so i went to let cows out to grass um well you went to um, make sure that their dry matter intake after calving is as high as possible so they have a good room and fill. So I'd say to keep keep cows in for a couple of days after calving so they maximize the dry matter intake and then um, slowly introduce uh, grass. It has shown um, if you keep cows in a bit longer on um, 
on silage, at least you're, you're able to measure how much you're allocating to the cow. You can maximize their dry matter intake and um, keep the rumen uh, ruminating, providing sufficient uh, fiber in the diet. Um, uh, so between, so first few days, I would recommend to keep them in. Um, so maybe a week after or two, um, it should be safe to let them out on uh, maybe out by day, in by night, to allow them to adjust to grazing uh, grass and letting the room adjust to to uh, grazing. Um, sorry, what was the first question? Yeah, the, the, what dry matter would you use for your opening grass farm cover? So if they're weighing grass, what, what dry matter is it? Roughly. Um, well, it depends if it, it was if there was a lot of rain, um, it'd be around 16% maybe, but um, gra uh, spring grass, the first rotation tends to be higher because um, it has grown over a longer period of time, so around 18% um, to dry matter. So dry ground is going to be 18, 20%, and, and if it's had a little bit of rain, it's down 16, 14. Very good. Uh, maybe somewhat related to that, um, and someone hasn't given the name, I have some heavy covers. When should I graze them? And it was too wet in the back end to graze them. So they've obviously got some very heavy covers there on the farm. When would you graze those, Elaine? Um, I'd graze. Uh, so if, if you have any clover, clover paddocks, um, I try and get them grazed as quickly as possible. Um, when when grazing conditions allowed to make sure um, you don't the, to make sure that clover swords um, get going again as much as I get the light down at the to the base to the clover. Um, if you have any covers over them uh, greater than twelve hundred kgs of dry matter, um, I'd um, try and graze them before mid March, um, because this will um, the paddocks will need to. Um, have time to recover going into the second rotation. So try and get them grazed if weather conditions allow, um, if they're great, uh, before mid-March. Um, yeah, yeah. No other lane. And I have a question here. Maybe we'll stick with you for a minute. Uh, pro my proteins are always low until the cows go out to grass. Why is this? Um, this could be a number of factors. Um, it could be poor quality silage. Um, they're not getting enough energy into the diet. So protein usually is an indicator of energy in the diet. Um, it could, could also be maybe not enough protein in the diet too. So there needs to be a balance. So a good way of um, checking that is looking at your milk ureas. So if your milk ureas are lower than um, 20, then this is an indicator that there isn't maybe enough uh, protein in the diet. Um, it, could, it depends when you're also going out to grass. So if you're uh, moving towards to peak lactation, there's also a dilution uh, effect um, on protein as well. So as your, your yield increases, your protein will slightly uh, drop as you um, get closer to peak milk yields. It also depends on your bond nutrition score, how much bond nutrition scores was lost after calving. If there, if you had a high bond nutrition score, they lost a lot of um, after calving, that will have an impact then on milk proteins as well. Yeah, no, that's, that sounds good. Mick, uh, Michael, um, question in from Tom in Wicklow. Um, and he's asking about costs, but maybe in general, is protected urea good value versus ordinary can um, calcium ammonium nitrate? And, and maybe uh, it, it, it is. It, it is. Look at the, the you know when you do look at the, at the cost per unit, you know you can safely say that protected urea is in around a third cheaper, you know, uh, normal ammonium nitrate. So look at uh, it, it is cheaper, and um, you know look at uh, as a product. I think you've got to, you know, promote it as much as possible from an environmental point of view, but, um, you know, economically, definitely cheaper than ammonium nitrate. Okay. And question there, no name. When should I apply the first round of fertilizer? Sure. We've kind of got, we've kind of gone through that there. So yeah. look, at you kind of be talking there, you know, you're, you're, say your graze ground, your 30, your 215s that you graze there would say, you're talking about mid-February. Okay. So you'd be going on with your 20 to 23 units of N uh, then to try and get, Get, get back in as quick as we can. I think one of the lessons we learned from last year, 
with the delay uh, in nitrogen, like look at how fertilizer wasn't spread from Valentine's Day onwards, you know, it did create kind of a deficit there uh, around um, the first week of April. So one of the lessons from last year is make sure you get that first round of fertilizer in uh, as early as possible, subject, uh, you know, to, to weather conditions. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure the location of this this farmer. Uh, he hasn't given name or, or location, but he says still have storage, but with mild weather now, should I go and spread slurry now or chance waiting until February the 10th? Look at soil, soil, look at ground is very, very waterlogged at the moment. So soil temperatures, you know, are not high. Uh, and I would say, um, you know, particularly with, with, um, with the use of, uh, of less equipment, you know, I would wait because what you want to do is you want to try and get, you know, as much utilization or value as you possibly can out of that slurry. Okay. So I'd say wait if you have the storage space, uh, you know, ground conditions with the help of God will improve. You'll get better utilization of the nutrients, et cetera. You know, and look at obviously, you, you probably get a better boost uh, on, on grass growth, but I'd wait if you have the slurry storage. And, and Michael, you talked about low emission slurry spread in there. Tell us, tell us about that. Why, why is it better? Why does it work better? I'll oh, sure look at you. You know, it's it's well talked about, Shane, in relation to low emissions. You know, ammonia lost in the atmosphere. If you were to look at a thousand gallons of slurry, um, you know, and just look at the nitrogen content on that, like you know, you know, splash plate. You know, you come up around six units. Uh, you spread the equivalent of six units of N per. Um, you know, per thousand gallons, less brings that up to nine. So it's kind of a, a 30% increase, you know, in the level of N in, in the slurry itself by using low emission uh, um, spreading technology. Yeah, no, very good, very good. Um, Elaine, um, question in just no name, but uh, what covers should I graze first? I presume they mean heavier light covers? Um, yeah, so at the start of the the grazing season so you tend to have less cows um and they've been on a gr grass silage diet so you would start grazing lower covers so between 800 and kind of 1200 of a cover so this will encourage um cows to start grazing it's not too heavy it allows you to move on one from area to the next a lot quicker and um, they're not just walking trampling over the grass um and it because if you're going to heavy covers uh cows aren't used to um having a, a high they don't even have a high intake but then they're not used to eating uh, grazing grass either so a lower cover will encourage them to eat and um, they move uh, quicker and allows you to build up then as cows have uh, grazing power which allows you to graze the heavier covers then once you have that grazing power yeah yeah um paul up in louth is asking what's the maximum amount of concentrates you can feed in a fresh calved cow um so you want to slowly build up your levels of concentrate so if you're if you're feeding a high level of concentrates let's say akgs um you want to um start uh, at a low base so two to three kgs initially um, and then build that um, by half a kg every second day um, and build it up to eight kgs. Now you don't want to be feeding or uh, you don't want to be feeding more than uh, three to four kilos in the parlor at one, any one time. This can cause um, acidosis or um, stomach upsets. And if you're feeding more than that, um, if, it, if you have the means to try and add it into the, the silage, if you would die of feeder, um, um, if you're feeding up to 10 kgs. Yeah, very good. Guys, we have um, we have three or four more questions there in and waiting. But just to remind you, if you do want to send any last questions in to our um, text number is 86 180 three nine four seven if you want to put any questions to our speakers just before we we finish up we'll probably finish up there in a few minutes um so mick for yourself um what advice would you give regarding multi-species swords um from nutrient perspective in the early season okay uh, good question uh, and, and one i suppose you know we're kind of learning to be honest but uh, to, to be honest about uh, you know um look at Multi-species, again, if you go back to the slurry piece, you know, try and get the slurry out. 
um, on that and look at it, it'll give a small bit of nitrogen, okay? But more importantly, you can give to P's and K's. And I think there's kind of a, a misconception there in multi-species that once you sow it, you know, people tend to forget, well, that's it, you close the gate, just bring the cows in to graze it. The big, big thing of multi-species is that you have to feed it with P's and K's, okay? So you, you have to make sure, you know, that you, over the course of the year, you're going with the likes of, um, you know, slurry, or you're going to like your 0730s or, or 0010s or something like that, just to make sure that you're um, uh, that that they're getting fed. Because if they're not getting fed, they won't produce. Uh, and it's just it's a thing we have to be careful of. You know, once you sow, people tend to think that manure spreader are never going again. You know, you, you definitely need to get the p's and k's out on it. Very good, very good. And Elaine, last two questions are for yourself. Um, how much energy and protein is in early season grass? And then maybe I know because the protein is fairly high at this time of the year. Is the, is the high protein any issue, and um, will that cause any problems? Um, so usually spring grass is between like nine five to uh, one UFL, so it's high energy, um, a high energy feed value, um, proteins um, average around eighteen percent, kind of for the first rotation. Um, because it had a longer time to grow across the winter period. But then once you come into the second rotation, um, these can uh, spike um, above 20%, so 24% of crude protein. This can be a problem in terms of fertility uh, coming into the breeding season if uh, uh, proteins or milk areas are too high. So it can have a negative impact on the uterine environment and um, the the oocyte then as well and um now there isn't the the research isn't conclusive whether um high protein diets do have a negative effect but some say they do and some say they don't so it's um uh, yeah, just it'll depend on the herd. So it's important to have that energy source in the in the diet to help cows um, be able to to utilize any protein in the diet as much as possible, and ensure they're not milking off their back as well as much because it takes energy to try and get rid of that excess uh, protein out of the diet. So ensuring the uh, energy is in the diet again. Um, that that yeah. that high protein intake from the grass can drive drive a lot of milk, which is not necessarily always we want. It's putting a, a greater energy demand on them, isn't it? Um, there's actually another question in, so we have two more for you again, uh, Elaine, uh, from Jim in Waterford. Um, my farm covers are he thinks his farm covers are low. Uh, what should the average opening farm cover be? Um, so it'll depend on your stock and rate. Um, so, and also whether you're um, compact calving or a, a longer calving over a 12 week period. So it'll depend on those factors. So if you are a uh, compact calving, a uh, high stocking rate, your, your average farm cover should be above uh, a thousand of an open average farm cover. So the higher, the better, um, because this will allow you to um, uh, give you a greater grass allocation to your herd. Um, particularly for that compact calf, and you'll have more cows grazing at any one time. And um, the average opening farm cover of, let's say, two and a half stocking rate is around 800 um, of an average farm cover. So it, it depends on your stocking rate. Okay, perfect. And the last one, Elaine, is for yourself, uh, unless there's any last questions, guys, if you get them in quick. Um, so your, it's from John and Tipperary, your views on once a day milking for fresh calf cows for the first two or three weeks. Um, yeah, it, it does have, um, once a day milking can be a positive effect, particularly those cows that are thin. So it allows um, them to, to kind of not lose more body condition to recover after calving. Um, so it doesn't push them in terms of milk production. And it's safe enough to do that for the first uh, two to three weeks because you haven't quite reached that um, drive up to peak milk. Um, but I wouldn't go 
beyond that, mm. um, it's a great way of building boundary score, particularly going into the, into the breeding season. Allows you, even if they go through the parlor, allows you to give them um, more concentrates with, without being milked as well. Yeah, so you can give the two opportunities to feed them, but maybe only milk them one of those times. Um, and one thing then from a veterinary perspective, I might just add in in terms of cell counts, just um, probably one for the low cell count cows anyway, um, because they don't have the, the twice a day flushing effect of, of milking out twice. So so uh, really good from a nutritional point of view and also from a labor point of view as well, Elaine, at this time of the year, when and especially there's only maybe a few cows in the, in the parlor, uh, once a day might be fine for the for the first week or two to uh, to get up and running. So look, that's that's the finish of our questions, guys. Thanks very much for for uh, for your answers to all the questions, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody on that's joined the call today for your participation and and, and your questions. Uh, look, we've given a lot of generic advice today and some specifics to the questions that were asked, but every farm is different and, and look for the bespoke solutions and, the, and the, the, the solutions to the problems that you might find on, on your farm or the, the management tips that you want to get. Don't be afraid to get in touch with your local uh, tier lawn advisor. So your business manager, your branch manager, or your milk supply manager, and they'll be able to help you through uh, solutions for your farm, be it on any of the topics that are of relevance at this time of the year. Hope everyone has got some good information and, and management tips from the webinar today. And we'll have our next webinar on tomorrow. Uh, with Yara Summers and Willie Darmody on calf rearing and animal health. So you're uh, very welcome to join us tomorrow at one o'clock again for that. So to close our webinar today, thanks to everyone for joining in and participating and to our speakers, Elaine and Michael, and also to James, Brenton and Tom, who've been working in the background to deliver the webinar for us. So thanks very much for joining us today and safe farming. <laughs>